All right, so now we're on to module two. We're gonna go ahead and start off with 2.1 quadratic equations. So in module one, we talked about linear equations and linear inequalities. And now we're gonna be expanding the type of equations that we can work with. In particular, as the name implies here, we have quadratic equations. So what is a quadratic equation? So let's define it. A quadratic equation is an equation that can be written in this given form. ax squared plus bx plus c is equal to zero. Where a, b, and c are real numbers, whatever your favorite numbers are, and we're assuming that a is not zero. When I write my equation in this form, ax squared plus bx plus c equal to zero, we call it standard form. So let's talk about this definition a little bit. The first thing I want to point out for a quadratic equation, part of the things, not everything about it, uh, part of the things that make it a e quadratic equation is that we have this x squared term. And to make it in standard form, I have that equal to zero. Those are two notes I want to point out. One other thing I want to point out is why did I put this condition that a not be zero. Well, what happens whenever a is equal to zero? Well, if I have a is zero, then I have zero x squared right here. Well, if I have zero x squared, that just becomes a zero. So my equation would just become bx plus c. And this looks a lot like my linear equations that we worked with before. So in other words, I want to make sure that a is not zero to make sure that I do have an x squared term. So there's many ways that we can actually solve a quadratic equation. We're gonna be talking only about a couple of them. There are other ways that I may not be mentioning, but uh, whatever way that you may be familiar with, you're free to use any of the methods. We're per in particular gonna be talking about, I believe, two or three methods. And so, let's look at our first method for solving a quadratic equation. So the first method, probably the more common method that you've heard of before, is the factoring method. So the factoring method goes through these following steps. To solve a quadratic equation by factoring, we first, we have to make sure our equation is in standard form. In other words, I wanna make sure my entire equation is equal to zero. I wanna match this ax squared plus bx plus c equal to zero. Step two is we're gonna factor it completely, if it's possible. If it's not possible, we will have to use one of our other methods. Step three is after I factor, I set each factor equal to zero, and then I can solve each of those individual equations. So if you're not familiar with what factoring is, this may sound all sort of confusing, so we're actually gonna go ahead and jump straight into example one and see what do I mean by these steps. So in example one, I have solve for x. Given that we have x squared minus eight x plus 12 is equal to zero. So to solve this quadratic equation, again, the first thing I need to make sure is that I am in standard form. I wanna make sure that I have ax squared plus bx plus c is equal to zero. Well, I look at this and I definitely have that form. I have all of my terms, whatever they may be, equal to zero. So in order to factor this uh, equation, what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna look at this one and I'm gonna call it a quote unquote simple quadratic equation. The reason that I'm calling it a simple, again, air quotes around simple, is that my first coefficient is a one. That is the number in front of x squared is a plain one. The reason that I mentioned this is that whenever this is not one, my solving my quadratic e equation through factoring can get a little bit more complicated and confusing. So we're starting off with this, in other words, simple qu uh, quadratic equation. So we benefit from calling this a simple quadratic equation because 
I here I have a trinomial. Recall that trinomial means that I have some expression with three parts, tri for three, where I have my first part, my second part, and my third part. So there are a couple of different ways that you can think about this. One way I can think about this is, well, I'm going to look at my last number, this is my c, and my second number, b, the negative 8. Let me go ahead and change my underline here to represent the negative 8. So whenever I have that my first coefficient is a 1, my goal is to break down this quadratic equation into two smaller portions. So whenever I break this down into two smaller binomials, so things that have two parts each, the reason why I benefit from my simple uh, quadratic equation is I automatically know that my first two uh, terms are just x and x. I know that whenever I multiply this out, I need to get x squared out. Now the question is, what goes in these two other blanks uh, next to my x's? Well, this is where my b and c are going to come into play. I need two numbers that multiply to give me c, or 12, and two numbers that add together to give me, in this case, negative 8. So we're just going to go down the list and think about all the numbers that multiply to give me positive 12, but add up to negative 8. So let's see. To make 12, we can say 12 times 1, but no matter how I add or subtract those, I'm never getting negative 8. Uh, let's see, we can do 3 and 4, but again, those don't add or subtract any type of way to give me uh, negative 8. Our last option could be 6 and 2, for example. If I did 6 and 2, initially it might not look like it works, but Remember, I'm multiplying the positive 12 and adding to negative 8. Well, one way that we can actually make positive 12 is by multiplying negative 6 and negative 2. By doing this, negative 2 plus negative 6, that definitely gives me negative 8. So what am I doing with these numbers? These are the numbers that I'm filling in for my blanks whenever I factor. In other words, I can write x minus 6 x minus 2. And so this is my factoring. I just factored my quadratic equation. So after I factor, we've actually done most of the hard work already. After I factor, I am able to set each individual uh, factor equal to 0. In other words, I can say x minus 6 equal to 0. x minus 2 is equal to 0. Now all I have to do is solve for x in each equation. For the first one, I can add 6 to the left and right to give me x is equal to 6. On the right, I can also add 2 and also get x is equal to positive 2. So we can see here I actually have two answers, positive 2 and positive 6. And again, you can check your answers by plugging in 6 into your original equation and plugging 2 into your original equation. You'll see that they both end up working out. This also brings up an interesting thing to note. For a linear equation, I only had one possible answer, or possibly all real numbers. Well, whenever I'm working at a quadratic equation, I can have up to two possible answers. So just a thing for us to note uh, as we're going through these. Very often, we're going to end up with two answers. We might end up with one answer. Perhaps it's possible to get no answers, but we have at most two. All right, so now that we're done with example one, let's move into example two. Solve for y. Now I've got 3y squared plus 7y minus 20 is equal to 0. The first thing I'm going to notice here, well, I guess there are two things that you can notice. First thing is usually we solve for x, but here I said solve for y. Remember that x and y are just uh, arbitrary. 
I could have said solve for x and replaced all my y's with x's. My choice of a letter, it could be w, it can be t, whatever letter is your favorite letter. Here I just chose y to change it up a little bit. The second thing I'm noticing here is that this has a different coefficient for my first term. Before my coefficient was 1 in front of my x squared, and I called it a quote-unquote simple quadratic equation. This time I have a 3 in front of my y squared. Well, fortunately for us, we're still going to have a little bit of a nice time with factoring this equation. So if I try to solve this by factoring, again, I'm trying to split this up into two portions that both equal 0 whenever I multiply them. The reason I said that my 3y squared won't give me that much of an issue is that we only have one way to multiply to give me 3, and that is 3 times 1. So this gives me a hint that I should have 3y and y, again because I want these to multiply to give me y squared. Uh, in particular, actually 3y squared uh, to be exact. Alright, so where do I go from here? Well, I'm going to use the trick that I know that the last two terms, whatever they may be, they have to multiply to give me negative 20. So I'm going to think of how do I get 20 from multiplication. Let's see, we have 20 times 1, uh, 10 times 2, 5 times 4. And these are some of our good options that we can work with. And since I'm multiplying to negative 20, I know that one of these will get, must be negative and one must be positive. So there's a couple of different ways that we can decipher this. One way that I can think about this is we can try doing a guess and check. Let's just keep on plugging in 21, 1, 20, 20, uh, 10, 2, 2, 10, 4, 5, or f uh, 5, 4, and these blanks and seeing wh what do we get? Do we get an accurate? Uh, factorization of this quadratic equation. There are, again, other ways to do this, but let's go ahead and just practice some guessing and checking. I'm going to go ahead and start from the bottom. Let's say I do 5 over here and 4. And again, one of these has to be negative, one of them has to be positive, because they have to multiply to positive, I mean negative 20, sorry. So let's go ahead and try positive 5 and negative 4. And we're going to see where this takes us. So let me go ahead and clean up the screen a little bit. If I have 3y plus 5 and y minus 4, if I were to go through this entire process, 3y times y, I get 3y squared. That's my first term. If I multiply the outsides, for example, 3y times negative 4, I get negative 12y. I multiply the insides, I have 5y, and then my last times the last, I get negative 20. So I got my negative 20. My question now is, did I get 7y out of this? Well, if I look at this, I get negative 12y plus 5y. Unfortunately for us, negative 12y plus 5y, we don't get positive 7y. We actually got negative 7y. However, we can quickly fix this problem. I got 7, I just didn't get a positive 7. I'm going to fix this very quickly by, instead of doing plus 5 and minus 4, what about if we do minus 5 and plus 4? Let's see if that works this time. Let's see, 3y times y, I get 3y squared, that's nice. 3y times positive 4, I get positive 12y. Negative 5 times y, I get negative 5y. And then uh, negative 5 times positive 4, I get minus 20. So once again, I have my 3y squared. Perfect. I have my negative 20. Perfect. Now I gotta ask, do I get 7y? Let's see, I have 12y minus 5y. 12 minus 5, I get 7y. So this tells me that my guess and check with these two options was accurate. This is great. 
so I know I have a correct factorization. I will say that one negative uh, downfall of this guess and check method is that here we got a little bit lucky and we didn't have to do too much work. Sometimes, based off the luck of the draw, perhaps you might have started from the top and went down through every single option. So sometimes it may be tedious and take a long time. We are going to talk about a method that allows us to get around this uh, a little bit later in this section. But regardless, we have it factored, and now I can go ahead and set each term equal to 0. I can write this as 3y minus 5 equal to 0, and y plus 4 equal to 0. Now I just have two linear equations where I need to solve for y. Starting with the left one. To solve for y, I would add 5 to the left and right, leaving me with 3y is equal to 5. And then if I want y by itself, I should divide by 3, leaving me with y is equal to 5 thirds. For my other equation, if I want to solve for y, I must simply subtract by 4 giving me y is a negative 4. And once again, notice that I have two answers, two solutions here. And so we are done with example 2. Uh, a couple of things I want to note is that if you're familiar, there are other methods such as the AC method uh, or you'll see our quadratic formula. Again, if, you're, if you prefer to use those methods, you're more than welcome to whenever that time comes around. And so we have our first method of solving a quadratic equation, factoring. Let's move to our second one. The second method we have is the square root property. So the square root property says if I ever have that x squared is equal to a positive number, then x is equal to plus or minus the square root of that number. One thing to be careful about here is that we must include the plus or minus. Let's see what happens whenever we work on example 3. Solve for x. This time I have x squared minus 19 is equal to 0. What I'm going to do here is, since I only have a single x term, notice here I only got an x squared. I don't have a bx like before. I'm going to go ahead and try to isolate my x. That is, let me go ahead and add 19 to the left and to the right. If I do that, I have x squared is equal to positive 19. Well, now I got x squared is equal to 19. Remember, my end goal is to just get x equal to whatever number. So somehow I have to get rid of this squared term. Well, to get rid of a square, we had to take the square root. So I'm going to take the square root of the left and the right. On the left, I get x is equal to, and on the right, remember, anytime I introduce a square root based off this property I had, I must put a plus or minus. And then we have to think, does the square root of 19 clean up? Well, the square root of 19, that is not a perfect square root, and it doesn't break down. The only way to make 19 is 19 and 1. So the best I could do is leave it as the square root of 19, giving me my final answer. Again, make sure you do not forget the plus and minus. This gives us two solutions. One is positive square root of 19, and one is the negative square root of 19. And so that finishes example three for us. Now let's go ahead and do another example involving the square root property. Example four, solve for x. Here it looks a little different. I've got negative five times in parentheses x plus eight squared and it's equal to negative 50. So you may be looking at this and be tempted to say, all right, I have a square. Can I just take the square root immediately? 
Well, we can't do that just yet. Remember, I can only use the square root property if I have on one side the whole thing squared equal to a number. So in this problem, I can't automatically take the square root because the whole left side does not have a square. I have a number times my squared object equal to whatever. In order to use the square root property, the whole side has to be squared. Well, to get around this, all I'm going to do is let's start off by actually dividing by negative 5. If I divide both sides by negative 5, on the left, I get x plus 8 squared is equal to positive 10. Because negative 50 over negative 5, I get a positive, uh, a positive 10 in particular. So I have this so far. So now I have a quantity squared equal to my number. This is the part where I am now allowed to use my square root property. I can now take the square root of the left and the right. So if I take the square root of the left and the right, on the left, a square root cancels with my square, leaving me with x plus 8 is equal to, make sure we don't forget the plus or minus, the square root of 10. And 10 doesn't break down and it's not a perfect square root. So we can leave it as a square root of 10. Alright, so don't forget our goal is to get x equal to some value. Well, the only thing stopping me from doing that is this positive 8 on the left. So I'm going to go ahead and subtract 8 from both sides, leaving me with x is equal to, and I'm going to write it a little bit differently. I'm going to write it as negative 8 plus or minus the square root of 10. And I'm actually going to leave my final answer in this form. The reason being is that we can't really simplify this any further. I have two answers, negative 8 plus the square root of 10 and then negative 8 minus the square root of 10. Again, I cannot combine my whole number with my square root. These are not like terms for us even though they are just plain numbers. And so that's how we work through example four. So that covers our square root method. Now let's talk about one last method. Probably the most famous one, the quadratic formula. One thing that I will say about the quadratic formula before I cover it is that the quadratic formula can be very nice because I know that the quadratic formula will work. The only part of it that I had to be careful about, for example here, I just noticed that I have a very big typo. My quadratic formula is given by, and I'll fix this real quick, negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. So I made a small typo and I accidentally put the negative on the far left instead of right on top with the negative b. So what the quadratic formula tells us is that if I have a quadratic equation in standard form, remember my quadratic uh, equations can be given in the form ax squared plus bx plus c equal to zero. What I must do is I must identify what is a, what is b, what is c, and then I plug it into my quadratic formula. So let's actually just go straight into our example 5. Solve for x, given x squared minus 5x plus 6 is equal to 0. So for this example, the first thing I want to note is that the factoring method will work for this problem. Remember what I said earlier is that I'm not necessarily looking for one specific method. If another method does work, you are welcome to use it. But for our purposes, we will use a quadratic formula so that you're exposed to this one. So my first question is, for quadratic formula, I must be in standard form. I have to have ax squared plus bx plus c equal to zero. So what I like to do is identify what is a, b, and c. So if I look at this uh, equation and try to write out my a, b, and c, 
Remember, a is the number in front of x squared. In this case, there's an understood 1 as a coefficient. So this tells me that my a is 1. b is the number in front of my x to the 1 power, or in this case, negative 5. And c is my plane and number. In this case, I have positive 6. Now that I've identified a, b, and c, all I have to do is plug it into my quadratic formula as needed. And then we'll simplify from there. So if I plug into my quadratic formula, I have x is equal to negative b. We said b was negative 5. Plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4 times a times c. And this is all over 2 times a. So this is me plugging in my a, b, and c into my quadratic formula that we showed before. Now our job is to simplify this expression. I'm going to do this one step at a time. So the first thing I will note I have negative negative 5. Well, minus a negative makes it into a positive. So that negative negative 5 becomes a positive 5. Plus or minus the square root of negative 5 squared. Negative 5 squared should give me 25. You can check this on your calculator. And one thing to be careful about is when you type it into your calculator, make sure you use the parentheses. If you just type in negative 5 squared on your calculator, that will not give you 25. Because your calculator reads it a lot differently than how we might be reading it. So something to be careful about. Uh, we have 25 minus 4 times 1 times 6. Well, 4 times 1 is 4. 4 times 6, I have minus 24. All over 2 times 1, I have, well, 2. Continuing to clean up, I still have 5 plus or minus the square root of 25 minus 24, we get 1. All over 2. Going down the line, I can clean up that square root giving me 5 as plus or minus. The square root of 1, we get 1, which is really nice for us, all over 2. I'm almost done with my cleanup work. Well, I'm looking at this, and I have a plus or minus. One way I can think about this is that this gives me two answers. One, where I'm adding 1, and the second, where I'm subtracting 1. Well, whenever I'm adding 1, I have 5 plus 1, which is 6, over 2. 6 over 2, I get positive 3. Now if I do 5 minus 1, I get 4. 4 over 2, I get 2. So I claim that these two are my final answers, positive 3 and positive 2. Or if I want to be more formal, I might write x is equal to 2 or 3. So using quadratic formula, I have my two solutions. So there is no factoring in this method. We just simply use the quadratic formula. And so we are done with example 5. And you can also check this. If you did factoring, you would also get positive 2 and positive 3 as your final answer. Now, let's go ahead to our final example for this section, example 6. I have solve for x, given 6x squared plus 12x plus 5 is equal to 10x. So, again, whenever I want to use quadratic formula, I have to make sure I am standard form. That is, I want ax squared plus bx plus c is equal to zero. So if I'm looking at this example, 
This is definitely not in standard form. Standard form says I must be equal to zero. Fortunately for us, this is a quick fix. I can go ahead and subtract 10x from the left and the right. If I do that, I'm left with 6x squared plus 2x plus 5 is equal to 0. Now I can claim I am in standard form. I have my ax squared plus bx plus c is equal to 0. Now I just follow the same steps I had earlier. I like to start off by identifying what's a, b, and c. Again, a is the number in front of x squared. b is the number in front of x. And c is the number by itself. So in this case, I have a is 6, b is positive 2, and c is positive 5. Now, I can plug into the quadratic formula. If I plug into the quadratic formula, I have that x is equal to negative b, or negative 2, plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4 times a times c, all over 2 times a. So we have something that looks like this. Now I must simply clean this up. Once again, I'm going to go and put most of my focus into cleaning up the square root, because this is where most of our calculations actually come into play. I have negative 2, that doesn't change, plus or minus the square root of 2 squared, I get 4 minus 4 times 6 times 5. Let's see, 4 times 6, we get 24. 24 times 5, we get 120. So I have 4 minus 120, all over 12. All right, so I continue this cleanup. I get negative 2 plus or minus the square root. 4 minus 120 we get negative 116 all over 12. So I'm looking at this problem and I have something interesting going on. I've got the square root of a negative number. Well, at this moment in the class, we don't know what we can do to simplify this expression. As far as we know, and if you tried it in your calculator, if you try the square root of negative 116, you'd get an error or something along the lines of that. So for now, we're going to say that I have no real solution. Again, this is because I cannot take the square root of a negative number at this point of the class. This means I have no real answer. Notice that I said at this point in the class. Actually, in the next section, we're going to go ahead and see how do I work with the square root of a negative number. And that's actually going to be called a complex or an imaginary number. But for now, we say no real solution, and we are done with example 6. And for section 2.1 on quadratic equations.